I started dispatching in 2004. In 2008, I decided I wanted to do something a little bit different and I decided to go to EMT school. So I worked both 911 and EMS and then eventually went full-time on the ambulance, I think around 2010, and I did that until our second child was born um, in 2014. And then after he was born, I decided it was too difficult to, for both of us to be in public safety, so I um, went to work in our ER. I've been in public safety going on 12 years now. I started out working in a jail, uh, worked my time there until I was able to go to a mandate get out to patrol. Um, I went to patrol in 2012. Since then, I've uh, did a little bit of everything. Uh, answer all types of calls. Uh, in 2015, I was promoted to uh, corporal over patrol. It was October 30th, 2016. We, we had originally met at a local um, grocery store because we were buying, the whole shift was gonna buy food for a family in need. Um, and Justin White, which was the deputy, was hurt in the accident. He was the, I think he was the last one to show up, but he was, he just swung by to drop off the money because as soon as he did that, we got a call for a cardiac arrest. Um, I started out, I went a little bit ahead of him. Um, he dropped his money off and then he, you know, followed slowly, or not slowly, but followed there behind. Um, on the way there, um, he approached the curve and for some reason, I don't know if the deer crossed out in front of him or another motorist or what have you, but um, he lost control, flipped his car. Um, I didn't find out until I had gotten to the scene of the original cause, cardiac arrest. Um, that's when dispatch advised that there was an accident that's possibly officer involved. So as fire was pulling into the scene where the cardiac arrest was, I left and responded to the accident. Um, once I got to the accident, I confirmed it was definitely involved. My car was upside down. I ran up to the car. Um, there was two citizens inside the car with him. Um, well, not not really inside the car, but I mean, their upper torso was in the car trying to comfort him. Um, I asked him to step back so I can go in and assess the situation. Um, he was he was laying there, you know, asking for help, and. Uh, I advised dispatch that, you know, he, we needed medics there, ASAP. And I believe I went ahead and asked for a helicopter and, you know, might as well send them if we can. So, um, but pretty much from that point, other officers started arriving. I stepped back and tried to take the command position of the uh, accident, allowed his coworkers to get in there and try to comfort him until they got him out. Uh, it was, it seemed like forever when uh, they were trying to cut the car open to get him out. The medic, uh, she was able to get him back and get him over to the ambulance. Um, come to find out, luckily, that the helicopter was there uh, because the nurse and the medics on the helicopter can do more than the medic on a bus can. So they were able to do certain things to uh, get him prepared to go to Atlanta. It was the night before Halloween. And I, mean, I don't really know what all went into play that night, but I remember that morning I woke up and I had a text message from um, one of my friends who was a paramedic and she said, Wesley's okay, but you need to call me. Um, so I was like, you know, that's really odd. Um, so we had the find my friend. I looked at that and I saw he's at Atlanta Medical Center. Um, and so I start panicking. I can't get a hold of him. And finally, I talked to I think his brother. He got a hold of somebody and told me what happened. Um, that one of his coworkers was in an accident. So, you know, it was just all kind of, a lot of emotions going on one time, worrying about him, worrying about other people, and like, 
you know, I found out his whole entire shift is there. And I was like, well, they've been up, you know, since yesterday afternoon sometime. How are they all going to get home without getting in an accident themselves? Just all these kind of things. Um, and it was all just kind of thinking back. It's kind of a blur. Um, but, you know, they came home. The They gave them, they were supposed to work that night but they gave his shift the night off um, because of what they had been through. So I remember trick-or-treating with the kids. And I think, you know, Wesley, you could tell that you know, he's worried about Justin. They kind of went back to normal life. He tried to go up to the hospital when he could. Um, I just remember him constantly like talking to people, I guess at the sheriff's office and Morgan and, some of his shift um, co-workers and trying to get up there to see him and all that kind of stuff. And then I remember them saying that he's not gonna make it. I know he went up to Atlanta sometime for them to bring him home. And then he, I don't know, somehow he got in charge of helping take care of Morgan and her family and helping her at the funeral home and practicing for honor guard and working his shift and he did all of that like i don't know that he slept for like an entire week trying to get take care of all of those things i don't think i allowed myself to feel uh, it honestly wasn't until about three or four months later that i actually processed and you know had my moment uh, dealing with it you know I, I had no idea that one of my co-workers meant as much as they did to me i had no idea the meaning of brotherhood when it comes to the badge uh until we lost justin i just thought you know everybody was co-workers and you know obviously we'll do what we can to help one another but until you lose one it's like it, it brings on a whole new meaning to brotherhood but i never really processed my feelings because i was more concerned about my co-workers uh, and the, the guys that work on the shift I work on, um, I was, my concern was them because even though I, I did supervise Justin, they, they went to calls, you know, nonstop with him. So they, you know, had just as close a relationship as anybody. Uh, so I, I don't think I really slowed down to take care of myself. I remember I was in my bedroom. Um, I don't remember if I was getting ready for work or, or what, but uh, nobody was at home. And I just sat there and just reflected on the whole situation. I mean, I was reflecting throughout the whole time, but it, it was, wasn't until then that it was like, you know, it hit hard that what, what happened. Forever, you could tell after that point, <sighs> he just, um... He started researching more about line of duty deaths, and then that went on to like um, police suicide and looking at um, the numbers of that. I don't know, I kind of felt like he kind of got obsessed with that, and it worried me um, that he was thinking something like that. And when I would say something to him, like, do we need to go talk to somebody? Do you need to go talk to somebody? He's like, no, no. It, he said, I just feel some kind of way. And I always just wondered, like, what does some kind of way mean? I've, I've been to trainings and I've, I've talked to people. Uh, we've, there's a sergeant that I've uh, worked closely with throughout the years. Um, he was the main one that reached out and he's talked to me several times. We've had lunch and he, you know, he's told me there's no shame in asking for help. Um, and I thought that was the help I was getting, you know, and it was, he's, he's helped me out a lot, but I didn't know, uh, I didn't really seek through EAP until after three years. It's difficult. Um, after our last child was born, he's also going some, through some health issues with his thyroid. And I couldn't tell, and it's also close to the anniversary of Justin's death. I couldn't tell if it was his thyroid or 
that being the anniversary of his death, but it was really hard then. Um, like all he did was sleep. And so I was kind of like getting resentful towards him because I was like, we have three kids to take care of. Um, and all you're doing is working and sleeping and you need to like get yourself taken care of. Um, it really, it was hard on me because I felt bad for being irritated with him and also because it was just a lot of work to take care of everything alone. I remember venting to my sister, um, like, I don't know how I'm gonna keep on doing this kind of thing, but I never told him. I just kind of like, I guess kind of prayed about him try realizing he needed to talk to somebody and kind of made subtle hints about, you know, maybe you should talk to somebody, but I didn't want to make it any worse. So I didn't just say, I can't stand this, you know, you have to do something because I figured it had to be on his own time. I've, I've been blessed because Katie was a, a dispatcher before and she was also EMS. And now she works, you know, at a local um, hospital, but uh, she's privy to a lot of things that most spouses aren't. So I'm able to actually talk to her about things and not expect her to, you know, think some kind of way toward it. So she, she's, she almost expects, you know, to hear bad things from me now as far as what I see. Uh, but she was, she was a blessing when it came to uh, dealing with everything after Justin's accident because um, she went to Washington, D.C. with me when we did the uh, memorial uh, service up there. Um, she, she'd been with me every step of the way. So I don't, I don't know if she, she saw something. She, when I asked for help for EAP, she's like, I've been waiting three years for this. But up until that point, you know, she never really said, you, you're changed, you need help type situation. But it wasn't until, um, I forget the date, but um, last year, I, me and my son was on the, on the bed watching TV. Uh, I think it was, they were out of school for whatever reason. Um, he had turned the volume up to the max on the TV and I told him to turn it down. And within a couple minutes later, I didn't realize he was sitting on the remote and he turned it up again. And uh, I yelled at him and I could see tears filling his eyes. And it was then I was like, why did I scream at him? Um, I realized I had overreacted. And, you know, Katie over the years has kind of led me to believe that there was some changes, but I really didn't see them until that point where, you know, something so minute uh, bothered me so bad that I, you know, lashed out and yelled at my son. And it was at that point, I uh, I guess I ain't really got no shame in telling it, but uh, I broke down and I couldn't, I couldn't catch my breath for like 30 minutes. I ended up calling my brother who also works with me um, and got the number for EAP and he, you know, counseled me for a little while uh, and then right after I got off on him I called EAP and you know started the process. I was told that the county would know somebody reached out but that it, I was protected. I wasn't going to be um, put in front of anybody to explain why I went out uh, or they wouldn't even have a name of, or the reason why. So yeah, it was completely confidential. And it took like almost three years for him to eventually go talk to somebody. Um, he got mad at one of our kids over something minor. I don't even remember what it is. He told me, but I wasn't at home. And he just said I yelled at him and it was not a reaction that he normally would have had. And he was like, I need to go talk to somebody. So he called his EAP then. And I think it was four sessions. Um, in my opinion, not enough, <laughs> but um, he felt that it was. I think it helped a little bit. Um, 
Also, when we went to Washington, D.C. for Police Week, he, ta um, he went to some classes there, and I think they helped him as well. There's no shame in it. Nobody has to know. Um, just ask for help, whatever you got to do. Just make sure you, you get the help because they're not going to take your gun away. You know, they're not going to take your badge away. They're not going to make you take time off unless you want time off. Um, just reaching out and talking to somebody. Um, now, I've talked to a lot of people over the last couple of years and they've said that they don't want to reach out because they don't want to go talk to some professional that doesn't know what we go through. Um, and that may be what you need to talk to somebody that knows what, doesn't know what we're going through um, to get the help because they're completely objective to the whole situation. But since then, I've actually started my um, college back and I'm going to college for psychology to try to appeal to those that will not get help. Um, just say, hey, I've, I've been in, been there before. If you're not willing to talk to somebody that hasn't been there, and here's somebody that has. So I'm just you know, trying to pursue, get out of law enforcement and pursue something that's actually going to help prevent suicides because uh, when I did go to D.C., I'm, I'm not going to, you know, dive off in it too much, but I, I didn't realize just responding to an accident would affect people so much, but there were some people there that they've had two coworkers commit suicide after responding to a coworker's accident. You know, you expect the stuff after responding, you know, having this uh, discharge your firearm on somebody or something like that, you know, it's, you know, that's what you hear about, but you don't hear about the ones that responded to an accident a couple of years ago not being able to handle it and uh, thinking the only way out suicide. So that's become my driving force is to get into college, get a psychology degree and try to start counseling any way I can. I mean, even though I don't get into it, I'll at least be prepared a little better to help those I work with.